Well, good morning. Can you guys hear me? There we go. Uh, good morning. It's good to be with y'all today. Uh, a lot of exciting things happening here at Riverside. A lot of cool opportunities um, to get involved here and outside of the church, which is uh, just great. Well, as Peggy said, uh, my name is Corey. I'm the student pastor here, and I am just excited and honored to be hanging out with you guys today. Um, if I don't look familiar to you, it's because my wife and I actually just moved to Fort Myers about three months ago. Um, to be a part of Riverside Church, and it's been great so far. Uh, we love the city. We love the people that are a part of this church. You guys have really welcomed us uh, with open arms. You've been very loving and caring to us, and so thank you um, for helping this be a good transition for us. Now, with that said, um, I've gotten to meet a lot of you, but I haven't gotten to meet everyone, so I feel like now would be a good time for a mass meet and greet. Does that sound good? All right, so here's what we're going to do, all right? I'm going to ask you two things, or ask you to respond with two things that are going to tell me all I need to know about who you are. Uh, one, what is your name? Two, what is your college football team? Okay? Because I learned very quickly in Florida that that's apparently the thing that matters more, um, sometimes even more than uh, being Christians, brothers and sisters. So that, that's another message for another time. We'll, we'll work on that. But um, on the count of three, I want you to yell that out, and I'll get to know you a little bit better, all right? You ready for it? All right, here we go. One, two, three. Okay, okay. Well, it's great to meet all of you. Now we can talk to each other, right? Now I see you in the hall and be like, how's your team doing? Uh, but listen, before we dive in, I want to say, um, if you responded to that last question with Georgia or uh, FSU, I just want to let you know there are a lot of great churches in the area that would love to have you, all right? Uh, I'm kidding, kind of. So um, a little bit of uh, fun facts about me so you can get to know who I am. Uh, I am a Florida Gator. I gladly jumped on that train uh, when we were moving to Florida. I didn't really have a college affiliation before that, and so uh, we're on that now. Uh, I'm initially from Corpus Christi, Texas, which is way down south. Uh, we're known for Whataburger and Selena, okay? So if you don't know that, you don't know culture. But that's where I'm from. Uh, after that, at 21, I moved up to Atlanta, Georgia. Was there for about six years. It's where I met my beautiful wife, Kara. I wish I had a picture up here, uh, but I don't. But she is just wonderful. Um, we got married going on two years ago now. So this is still kind of a new thing for us. But um, again, she is just the greatest. No kids, one cat. We're going to keep it that way. <laughs> I am a sushi addict. It is a problem and a pleasure. And I love good coffee. That's the main thing you need to know about me. I love good coffee. I am what you might call a coffee snob, though I prefer the term aficionado because that is nicer. So because I am a coffee aficionado, I have a lot of different contraptions at my house that I make coffee with. Uh, and I brought one of them in today just to, to show you. Um, this one is not fancy. This is kind of a classic, all right? This thing's been around for a long time. In fact, if you're from the north, you may especially recognize this. It's got some Italian roots. But um, this thing is called the mocha pot. And the nice thing about this little contraption is that um, there's only like three easy steps to make a good cup of coffee that will probably have you bouncing off the walls after the fact. And so I like this thing. And so here's how it works. Um, essentially, what you do is you take apart the little piece on the bottom, like so. Try not to drop it. So you put the water in the bottom of this little contraption. Then you got this little cradle in the top. That's where you put your coffee. And then from there, once you get the water, you got the coffee in, screw it back on because that's important. And then you simply put it on the stove and you wait. Now, here's what you're waiting for. I have my handy-dandy diagram up here that'll help us uh, see this a little bit better. So in simple terms, you're waiting for the water to boil in the bottom of it, to bubble up, comes up through this spout, hits the coffee, the coffee expands, and then through pressure, it forces the coffee all the way up out of the spout and creates a coffee fountain. There are a lot of great fountains in the world, chocolate fountains, fondue fountains, but a coffee fountain might be the best. And so this is the end result. I think we have another picture that shows you what this thing is supposed to look like, right? So there you go. Then you have this thing. It's filled up with coffee. You pour it in and you enjoy it. 
It's a lot of fun to do. It's a lot of fun to watch. But I bring this up for a reason because this little contraption uh, is it works based on the coffee coming from the inside out, right? So it starts here in the bottom inside of this contraption, and then it is forced by pressure or forced, um, yeah, by pressure, its way out, and then you have a great cup of coffee. Now, I bring this up for a reason because when you look at James, in James chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, which is what we're going to look at today, we're going to see that the same thing happens with our faith. Our faith has to work its way from the inside out. And so we're going to see that today and and sort of walk this path that James is going to take us on from our hearts to our words to our actions. So if you guys are with me, go ahead and turn to James chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. We're going to read about what true religion is and how it affects our lives. But before we do that, will you guys pray with me? God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the comfort that is in it. We thank you for the challenge um, that is in it. And God, I pray that uh, today that we would see you and that at the end of this, God, we would be challenged to um, to follow you closer. We'd be challenged to lean in more, but uh, more than anything, I pray that we would just see Jesus, our Savior, on display. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, again, we're in James chapter 1 verse 26 and 27. I want to read both of those verses together, and then we're going to go back and sort of break that down a little bit. James starts off, he says, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, let's get a little bit of context here so we can understand what James is talking about. If you were here last week, you know that Steve preached from James chapter 1, verses 19 through 25. And there's a key verse in the middle of that, in verse 22, that says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. And so we ended on the topic of doing. Because we are no longer in Adam in sin, we are now um, a part of Christ. Now we can put off our old selves, we can put on our new selves in Christ, and we can do what Jesus says. So we've been talking about doing, and so I think James here is continuing in that same thought process. I think he's sort of putting a bow on the thought that he started in verse 19. So let's go back and break this down a little bit. Let's look at verse 26 again. He says, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Now, let me share a quick asterisk before we get going. Religion in our country has a lot of different connotations. Religion can kind of be seen as a rule-based thing. It can be seen as um, something that you know, we are trying to earn our way to God. And so that's not what we are talking about here. But because James uses this word, that's the word I'm going to use. It's sort of a broad term in the Greek, and it can really just be translated as worship. So if you get hung up on the idea of religion, maybe because of your background, or uh, maybe because you understand some of those, um, some of the connotations that come with that word, then you could at least think about it in light of that word worship. So here James starts, and he is making a direct correlation between our religion or our worship and our tongues. He's making a strong case between our worship and our tongues. And he uses some interesting and maybe a little bit unfamiliar um, imagery here, especially if you're a city slicker like me, you didn't grow up um, kind of in the country. And so he's using imagery of a rider and their horse. So before I get too far into this imagery, I would like to acknowledge that um, I know very little about equestrianism, which is a fancy word for horse riding. I googled it. (laughs) Equestrianism. Don't know much about it. Uh, In fact, my sister-in-law is an equestrian. I guess that's what you would call her. She rides horses and stuff. 
And anytime we have a conversation, I try to ask her about how that's going. I don't know how to talk about it. I just say, how's the horse stuff going? And she, she explains, you know, here's actually what I do. And every time I'm like, I don't understand this. But I at least understand it enough to get what James is saying here. And so we have a little picture that will help you understand a little bit. Um, and if you're used to Steve's preaching, I want to make you feel a little bit more comfortable. So I want to give you a little handy dandy explanation. Can we get the next slide, please? Horse. That is a horse. Okay. In case you didn't know, that is a horse. All right. So if you look back at that picture, what you will notice is this horse is wearing a, uh, some headgear on its head, and that is called a bridle. And so this whole thing is called a bridle, and then you have the bit which goes into the horse's mouth, and then you have the reins which come up and the rider grabs a hold of that. And the whole purpose of this entire contraption is to control and direct the horse to where you want it to go. And so James is using this imagery on purpose and he's telling us essentially that we need to keep a tight rein or we need to control our tongues. But I also find it interesting and even kind of funny that James compares our tongue to a horse. It's a little bit of a a weird imagery. And at first I kind of go, James, I don't know if you hit the mark on that analogy, bro. Like, let's try again. But if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because a horse without a bridle can't be controlled. It has a mind of its own. It can do whatever it wants. And horses are powerful. And these are all reasons why I have no desire to ride one. <laughs> Again, my, I have two sister-in-laws that do this for fun. Let's go get on top of this wild animal and ride around. I would rather go to a pool because the pool is not going to try to kill me. It doesn't have a mind of its own. And if it does, you need to find a different pool. So they like to relax by horse riding. But again, I am a little bit afraid of that because a horse has a mind of its own. I don't know if I can control it. And so the same thing works with our tongues. In fact, there's another passage in the book of James later. I think it's in uh, chapter four where James compares our tongue to fire. He, He compares our tongue to fire that has the ability to burn a forest down. James is, he's starting pretty strong, right? He's not pulling any punches about our tongues or about our words. In fact, I remember when I was in high school, uh, me and my friends, we tried to do this thing um, because it wasn't always saved. And we tried to do this thing where we wanted to see who could go the longest without cursing. I'm going to give you a couple options so that you can see how long you think we went. Anyone think we went three days? Raise your hand. Anyone think two days? Raise your hand. Anyone think one day? One day, raise your hand if you think that's how long we went. Okay, if you didn't answer to any of it, um, you were right because it lasted an hour. (laughs) Because it's very difficult to control the tongue, to control your words. And that's what James is getting at here. Now, obviously, it's not just about cursing, although we do have to honor God with the words that we use. But I know people that, that don't curse at all, but they've done more damage than the most foul-mouthed sailor. Because we can use our words to, to cut people down, to belittle people. We can use our words to wound people. We can use our words to, to traumatize people. So there's a lot of responsibility in that, and that's what James is getting at. He's saying, listen, if your religion doesn't have an effect on your words, it's no religion at all. If you think you are religious, but your religion doesn't affect the words that come out of your mouth, you are deceived. In essence, I think James's primary point that he is working from and giving us these practical implications is this true religion works its way from the inside out, right? Just like this little mocha pot that I showed you, true religion has to start in our hearts and then it has to work its way out to our words and then we're gonna see that that path continues. That is what James is getting at. He's saying, listen, if your religion stays inside and it doesn't affect how you live, it's worthless, 
It's a strong word. It says religion is worthless. This word worthless in the Greek could be translated as vain or useless or meaningless. So in essence, he's saying your, your religion is no religion at all. Your worship isn't really worship. When I was studying this last phrase, I thought about a book in the Old Testament. It's one of my favorite books in the Bible. It's called Ecclesiastes. It's kind of a strange book, but I love it. And it's believed that Solomon was the writer of the wisdom that is collected in this book, Ecclesiastes. And Solomon is sort of struggling through life. He's trying to understand the meaning of life. He's trying to understand God. He's, he's wrestling with a lot of things. And so because of that, he has sort of a melancholic disposition. And so throughout it, he uses this phrase where he says, life is vanity or all is vanity. Some translations say meaningless. I don't think that quite gets the point across because this word vanity in the Hebrew is the word hebel, which means vapor, breath, or smoke. He's saying life is smoke. I can't quite grab it, right? There's no substance to it. I'm trying to find meaning, but I'm struggling to get a hold of it. I think this fits with what James is saying. Because he's saying, I can't quite find the substance to life. He's wrestling through this. But I think James is saying this about religion. He's saying religion that doesn't work its way from the inside out is smoke. There's no substance to it. And that's a challenging thing for a lot of us, especially when we um, live in a country where we can remain fairly comfortable. We can remain fairly safe in our religion. James challenges us, you got to make sure that this is working its way from the inside out. Now, with that said, James has more to say. So he says, our words and our tongues affect our religion, but that's not the only thing. We're going to continue walking this path out. Look at verse 27. James says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So you see how he's continuing to work his way out? He starts in the heart. Now we're up to our words, and now we're out to our hands. We're out to our actions. He's saying our religion affects our words and our actions, specifically how we serve others and how we honor God in the world. So two things, how we serve others and how we honor God in the world. Let's start with the first. Pure and undefiled religion is to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. James brings this up because James would have known the Torah. He would have known the first five books of the Bible. He would have been familiar with that. And so he's drawing from the Torah when he brings up widows and orphans. Look at what the Torah says about this subject. Exodus twenty-two twenty-two. He says, you shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. Now, orphan in James's day and age could have meant that it was a, uh, a person who had lost both of their parents, or it could have meant that it was a kid who had lost one parent. So it doesn't necessarily mean both, but either way, you can see how that would be a tragic situation. And nonetheless, he says, hey, don't mistreat the widow and the orphan. Then if you go to Deuteronomy 10, 18, he says, God executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Now, these are just two examples, but in these two examples, God is pretty clear. Don't mistreat the widows and orphans. And as for me, as for God, I will execute justice on behalf of the widows and orphans. And I think James brings this up for a reason. Because we may ask the question, well, why did James specifically bring up widows and orphans? Because in Deuteronomy, we just saw that God also mentioned sojourners. There's other examples of justice or people in need in the Old Testament or in the Torah. So why did James pick these? I think James brings up these two categories, not to limit us, but because he is pointing out two groups of people who would have been the most vulnerable and marginalized groups of people in his day. 
Those would have been two of the most vulnerable and marginalized groups of people. An orphan, if they had lost both of their parents, they may not have the resources. They may not have any of the things that they would need to find stability in life or to move on to whatever would be next after something like that. Even if it was an orphan who had lost one parent, you can imagine the emotional turmoil that that would have taken. And it would have been especially hard if they had lost the father because that's where James gets into this idea of widows because women in James's day wouldn't have had as many opportunities to make money. There weren't any kind of social systems in place to help them in a time like that. And so if you're an orphan, fatherless child, if you're a widow, then you really are in a place of, I don't have anything. I don't, I don't have a plan. I don't know where I'm going. And you had no help to get you there unless the church intervened. And so that's what James is getting at. In fact, I think here's what James is doing. I think James is calling the church to do justice on behalf of the marginalized and the vulnerable. That's what the church did back then. See, no one's taking care of the widows. That means we have to. And no one's going to take care of the orphans. That means we have to. He's saying to do justice on behalf of the marginalized and the vulnerable shows that our religion is genuine. Now, with that said, that's kind of a broad statement. And it may even be a little bit overwhelming because really, anywhere you look, you will find need. You will find people in a bad situation. And so it may be overwhelming to go, well, well God, there's so much need in our world. There, there's so many vulnerable and marginalized people. I mean, what are we even supposed to do? And so we can kind of freak out and get overwhelmed and, and just freeze and go, well, I, I can't do anything. If there's so much need, I don't even know where to start. But let me free you a little bit. Everyone can't do everything, but everyone has to do something. So it's easy for us to get overwhelmed. It's like if you ever gone to a restaurant and they have a giant menu, it's like that feeling. You go in and you're like, I don't, I don't even know what food is anymore. It's going to take me two hours to get through this, not two minutes. It's like that. We see all the needs and it's difficult for us to address, but we got to do something. There's so many avenues that we can take part of as the church and as Christians. Maybe it's caring for orphans. Maybe it's alleviating local poverty or global poverty. Maybe it's pursuing racial reconciliation. Maybe it's caring for the fatherless, assisting widows in need, giving towards developing Bible translations for foreign countries, helping those with special needs, being an advocate for mental health for those that are struggling with that. I mean, there are so many different things that we can do. And, and so really, instead of seeing it as an overwhelming, I don't know how to respond, we can see it as a, wow, there's so many options. And if I could just get with God, then maybe he can push me in the right direction. And that's where it gets fun. Because you get to lean in with God. If you don't know any of those avenues that you want to be a part of, then you get to get with God and go, okay, God, well, what does this look like? Show me, lay a burden on my heart. Show me a need. Show me where my gifting can make the most difference. Show me where the way you've wired me where I can do the most good. And it doesn't have to stop at a certain age. My dad is a Christian. He was a pastor at one point in time, and um, now he's continuing to work and help churches. But um, even as of late, he's 60. And even as of late, he is um, pursuing new things that God is laying on his heart. God is laying new burdens on his heart right now for people he needs to care for and groups of people he needs to go and serve. So at any point in life, you can get with God and go, God, what is this? I have things that I feel passionate about, but those may be different from you, but we got to do something. So James is calling the church to do justice on behalf of the marginalized and the vulnerable, but then he's saying you can mold that to your personality, right? You can do that in a way that takes shape in your own life. 
Again, this is, this is a little bit of a tough message. It says, hey, if, if your religion, if your worship is going to be genuine, it's got to affect the words that come out of your mouth. It's got to affect the people that you serve. And it's got to affect the way you honor God. It's got to affect the way you honor God with your actions. Because this hands idea, this actions idea is not just what we do, but it's also what we don't do. All right? What did he say? He said, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. I think James is covering all of his bases here. Right now he's sort of going in a full circle. Because he's saying it affects your heart, then it comes out to your hands, or excuse me, it comes out to your tongue, then it comes out to your hands, and now, now we're sort of circling back. He's challenged us that your religion can't stay on the inside, but now he's almost saying the opposite. But now he's saying, also, just in case you're confused, your religion can't only be on the outside. It can't only be on the outside. You can't look really good and take care of the needy and serve the marginalized, but then go live in intentional sin when no one's looking. You can't just have this public persona of Christian, but if someone were to ask your wife or someone were to ask your husband or someone were to ask your best friend or someone were to ask your coworkers, they're like, not a chance. They're a Christian? It's got to be both. And I, and I think the point that James is getting at, he says it works its way from the inside out, but true religion affects every part of your life. It has to. True religion affects every part of your life. And that's tough. Because it, it seems like kind of a high bar. I mean, some of you in here may even feel the pressure of that. I mean, we all struggle at times with apathy and sort of just closing off from the needs of the world. And we all struggle with sin. And so it may seem tough to, I, I don't know if I'm, do I measure up to what James is saying? I, I, don't, I don't know if this works. I, I think about my sin and I go, is my religion genuine? In fact, it gets even tougher because we've been walking this path in James, but there's another passage in the Bible that walks this same path from the heart to the mouth to the hands, but it's in Romans 3, and it's a different subject. It's a different focus. Look at Romans 3, 13 through 18. Paul is talking about people who are in sin, who have not trusted in Jesus, and he says, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips, their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. And their paths are ruin and misery in the way of peace. They have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. He's walking the same path, but with a different focus. He says, sin works from the heart to the throat, to the lips, to the mouth, to the feet. It covers all of you as well. Right? Sin has totally affected every part of our lives as well. So that makes it even tougher, right? Because now we go, well, James is calling us to true religion that affects every part of our lives. But Paul just told us that we came from a place of sin, where sin has affected every part of our lives. So again, we're left with this struggle of, I don't know if I'm going to measure up. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get to the standard that James is Laying, how does someone get from impure, defiled sin to pure and undefiled religion? How do we bridge that gap? If you ask that question, it's a great question to ask. Because pure and undefiled religion has to start with a pure and undefiled Savior. Pure and undefiled religion starts with a pure and undefiled Savior. How do we get from here where we're totally covered in sin? And how do we get over here where we are totally sold out in worship to God? It has to start and end with Jesus. Because he was the only pure and undefiled Savior anyway. He's the only one that could do this. Again, let's be honest here. Raise your hand if you sinned this week. Just go ahead and lift it up. 
Okay. Keep them up. If your hand is not up, you just lied. <laughs> Lying is a sin. Put it back up. You have, you have entered the tribe of people who have sinned this week. We have all sinned. There was only one pure and undefiled person, and that was Jesus. He never sinned. 33 years, he never sinned. He stayed pure all the way until his death on a cross, which means he is the only one that is worthy or able to cover the totality of our sin and make us into a person who has a pure and undefiled religion. It's only Jesus. He has given us an opportunity to have a relationship with God now and forever. Why? Because everything sin rotted, the son redeemed. Everything sin rotted, the son redeemed. But that's why it has to start inside. It's got to start in our hearts. It's got to start with Jesus. So yes, James's words are challenging, and it, and it does. If we are Christ followers, it pushes us to go, am I using my words in a way that honors Jesus? Am I serving the people around us? Am I abstaining from sin? Not am I perfect, not am I never going to stumble, but am I moving in the right direction? But ultimately, when we stumble, when we fail, as we are being sanctified to be more like Christ, we can look to Christ who is pure and undefiled and absolutely 100% irrevocably committed to making us into his image. And that's the good news. It's a challenging passage, but the good news is that Jesus says, hey, if you're trying to get from here to here, I got you. One, I've already covered all your sins. You're perfect in the eyes of the Father. Two, right here and now, as you are trying to be sanctified to look more like me, I'm with you. I'm in that process. I am helping you. So true religion works its way from the inside out. It affects every part of us. Our words, our actions, our hearts, our purity. And it all hinges on continually trusting in Jesus, the undefiled Savior, to make us more like himself. Would you guys pray with me? Jesus, we thank you that this is true. God, we know that these are phrases and ideas that we can become far too accustomed to. We can become far too familiar with. But God, I just pray that as we go throughout this week, God, that we would remember that you truly are our pure and undefiled Savior, and that you have died for us to make us into your image. So God, challenge us with these words. Challenge us with the words we use, the actions we take. But in that, would you walk with us? Would you change us? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.